Thank you, Professor Elias. Uh, thank you for the invitation to visit uh, Israel and to participate in this symposium. Um, I would like to present results of work done in my research group as well as work done by colleagues in other research groups in a particular area that focuses on a particular application. And the question is the following. What is the role of mechanics at the cell and molecular levels in influencing the onset and progression of human diseases, different classes of human diseases? And this is a topic that's not new, and it's been done in the community for the last 30, 40 years, starting with the mechanical aspects of pumping of the human heart, flow of blood through arteries and, ve and veins, um, looking at uh, different properties of um, mechanical properties in conjunction with biochemical and biophysical properties. But what has been new in the last 10 years is that we can understand the mechanical characteristics of a single biological molecule, a single DNA, a single biological cell with a force precision of a pico-newton on a desktop instrument and a displacement resolution of a few nanometers, sometimes even less than a nanometer. We can also do full three-dimensional computational simulations with the sophistication that we could not have done just a few years ago. So with these topics in mind, the motivation for this work is the following. How are human diseases influenced by changes in cell and molecular mechanical response as precipitated by changes in biochemistry that occurs either naturally in the human body or it comes to the human body through a foreign organism, a vector. Conversely, how do changes in disease states affect in vivo the cellular molecular properties so that we can look at new novel therapeutics, diagnostics, and drug efficacy assays? Our goal is through a series of in vitro experiments as well as in vivo experiments link single cell mechanical response to biology, biochemistry, systematic and controlled genetic manipulation of cells with the ultimate objective of connecting it to human diseases. To complement experiments, we are also going to look at full three-dimensional computational simulations at different length scales and you will see video clips of our experiments and simulations throughout this talk. We've looked at three different very broad classes of human diseases. In the case of infectious diseases, we have systematically studied for the last seven years in collaboration with not only biologists but by, with medical community, uh, Plasmodium falciparum malaria, and we are starting to study Plasmodium vivax malaria. We've also looked at different types of cancers, human cancers, so I will focus the bulk of my talk so that we can go into depth on malaria. At the end of the talk, I'll talk about different types of cancer and compare and contrast uh, the conclusions that we draw with respect to the role of single cell mechanics on human diseases. For those um, who may not be familiar with human malaria, Malaria is the most devastating infectious disease affecting humans. So every year, approximately 400 million people in the world contract some form of malaria. And according to the World Health Organization, somewhere between 2 million and 3 million people a year die from malaria. The carrier for malaria in the human body is the human red blood cell. Every second, our bone marrow produces several hundred thousand red blood cells and releases them into the bloodstream. The hemocrit, or the concentration of red blood cells in our blood, is about 40 percent. The range is anywhere from 30 to 50 percent. And because of that, the color of blood is red. 
The red blood cell has a unique biconcave or discoside shape, which is shown in the bottom left figure. The long diameter of the red blood cell is 8 micrometers. So why is mechanics important? I mean, this has been studied for a long time. The red blood cell is like a model system. It has no nucleus. It has no DNA material in the nucleus. It has cytosol, and its sole function in the human body is a gas carrier. It takes oxygen from the lungs to distant corners of the body and takes carbon dioxide back to the lungs. The 8 micrometer diameter red blood cell has to go through small blood vessels in our brain whose inner opening is as small as 2 to 3 micrometers. So in order to squeeze an 8 micron object through a tube whose inner diameter is only 2.5 micrometers, it has to undergo large reversible elastic deformation. So in that sense, during the course of its 120-day lifespan in the human body, the red cell circulates through the human body millions of times, stretching and contracting by more than 100%, undergoing reversible elastic deformation. So the blood cell is actually a beautiful fatigue machine. Whenever the cell loses its ability to stretch by large amounts in a reversible manner, we get a disease. So if you're, a, if you're of Scandinavian extraction, you have a 1 in 5,000 chance of genetically inheriting a disease called spherocytosis, where the red cell is not biconcave in shape, it's spherical in shape. A sphere cannot squeeze through a tube of much smaller opening the same way a discocyte can. And as a result, in the severe form of spherocytosis, uh, one has to have splenectomy, removal of the spleen, as a precautionary measure. If you are born in Asia, you are genetically predisposed to a disease called Asian ovalocytosis, where the red blood cell, rather than having this discocyte shape, has uh, an oval shape, which also causes uh, problems with oxygen transport. If you are a person of African origin, you are genetically predisposed to a disease called sickle cell disease, where in the sixth position of the amino acid, valine is substituted by glutamic acid. As a result, in the deoxygenated state, the red blood cell, uh, the alpha-beta uh, molecules, uh, rather than forming uh, a shape that's spherical, they form a fibrous shape. As a result, the entire shape of the red blood cell becomes sickle-shaped, and this causes problems with the transport of the red blood cell in the de deoxygenated state in the human body. So you can see the connection between deformability and disease. You can also see a connection between shape and disease. So there are a lot of fundamental questions that arise. There are also practical questions that arise. So the purpose of my talk is to walk you through a series of studies that we have looked at, from fundamental studies to potentially translational studies for different diseases that you can look at by bringing in different disciplines. Let me first start with healthy red blood cells. And this is a topic that has been studied for a long time using conventional techniques like micropipette aspiration, where you take a cell, you take a glass tube of smaller diameter, you apply suction pressure, the cell is either partially or completely aspirated into the glass tube. Then you do computational simulations to infer the mechanical response. Unfortunately, for disease studies, that's not sophisticated enough and refined enough to do a systematic study of mechanical response. And there are a number of reasons why it's important. I mentioned that when a red blood cell goes through a small blood vessel in the brain, it has to stretch by more than 100%. And in, while it stretches, the force that you need to simulate that stretch in vitro is as small as one piconewton. And the range of forces that you need is somewhere between 1 and 100 piconewtons. So you have to do that in a micron-sized system, in a fluid medium, where you have fluid on the inside and you have fluid on the outside. And this is a grand engineering challenge to do this experiment. So we tried this about six years ago. The first experiment took us about nine hours to do. Now we can routinely do them in about five minutes. We have done about 800 of these experiments. And this involves laser tweezers or optical tweezers. And all the experiments that I'm going to demonstrate here 
is the work of my graduate student, John Mills, uh, at MIT. The experiment is the following. We take a healthy human red blood cell, which is shown here, and we attach two high refractive index glass beads, which are sort of like grips in an Instron machine. To keep the cell alive, we have it in a phosphate buffered saline solution. We can functionalize the bead with a, with a chemical called Con A, which binds the bead to the red blood cell at diametrically opposite ends. Now we can do the experiment in one of many different ways. For example, you can take two laser beams, shine the laser beams at the bead, at the center of the bead, avoid the cell, and depending on the wavelength of light, depending on the focal point of the laser beam on the bead, depending on the differences in refractive index between the bead and the surrounding medium, and depending on the diameter of the bead itself, once you shine a laser beam at the bead, you trap the bead, hence the name optical traps or laser traps. So in an engineering sense, you can explain it in a simple way. The incoming laser beam has a certain momentum. It refracts through the bead. When it comes out, the momentum is different. Change in, change in momentum is a measure of force. If you sum up all the forces, the effective force traps the bead. When you move the laser beam, the bead moves with it. So you can have two beads, like two grips, as shown here. You can have two laser beams, and you trap the two beads and move them in the opposite direction, you get uniaxial tension. In our case, we trap the lower bead with the laser beam. That's why it's shiny. The upper bead is attached to a glass slide. The lower bead, the trapped bead is stationary. The upper bead moves. How do you calibrate the forces? You use standard principles in fluid mechanics. You take a bead, you trap it with a laser beam of known power, then you flow fluid across it, say phosphate, phosphate buffered, buffered saline solution at a certain velocity. You keep increasing the velocity until the point the bead is dislodged from the laser beam. Then if you know the velocity of the fluid, the diameter of the bead, the viscosity of the fluid, you can use Stokes' law to calculate the force, which is six times pi times viscosity times radius, and you apply correction factors, you calibrate the force for a given laser, uh, laser power. So now you know force and displacement through video recording, you get the force displacement curve. So that's the principle behind it. Let me demonstrate how this experiment works with a video clip. So you can see the uniaxial stretching of the red blood cell. When you let the laser beam go, the cell goes back to its original shape. This is still very highly idealized. It's not realistic, so I'll come to more realistic examples later. So the next question is, how do you interpret these experiments? How do you extract in-plane shear modulus and bending modulus of the red blood cell so that you can correlate it with changes in biophysical characteristics, biochemical characteristics, and connect it to a disease like malaria? For that, we go to, we did continuum level models. That's what many people have done. But these days, with the sophistication of computer software and hardware, we can do much better. So if you look at any undergraduate cell biology textbook, this is the molecular structure of the spectrin network, which is the cytoskeleton of the human red blood cell. It has approximately triangular-shaped network. It has alpha, beta spectrin molecules, and the length scale is 100 nanometers. These molecules contain domains of amino acids, uh, chains that are linked together, and they are tethered to the membrane of the red blood cell through specific proteins. Uh, an, uh, an error or a defect in these connections leads to different types of hereditary blood disorders, which are inherited disorders. So now what we can do is ask a fundamental question. Why did nature make the red blood cell biconcave? Because I said earlier, the biconcave shape optimizes surface to volume ratio so the cell can go through small blood vessels in the brain. But nobody has done a full field computer simulation of an entire cell with all the spectrum molecules. So we decided to try it. In order to try it, we use free energy minimization principles, and this is what we do. We know 
from single molecule experiments in an atomic force microscope, what is the force displacement relationship? So we can calculate the free energy penalty associated with the stretching of a single molecule. Then we can compute the free energy penalty associated with maintaining a network of a certain area, in this case, an approximately triangular network. Then we can calculate the free energy penalty associated with curvature or bending of the surface. From that, we can relate it to the bending modulus. We can calculate the free energy penalty associated with maintaining a constant area or a constant volume from which we can link it, link it to the persistence length of the molecules. So all this gives us a powerful computer tool to model the total free energy of all the molecules in the entire human red blood cell. So we resort to molecular dynamic simulations where we take a sphere of the same surface area as a biconcave red blood cell. But the sphere of the same area has 40% more volume. So we have the right area, the wrong volume. We take the surface of the sphere, we triangulate the sphere to create spectral network. By necessity, you have to have these defects. Then we randomize the different sides of the triangle. So we go from three noded to four noded to five noded to hexagonal and so forth. We also put in thermal agitations so that by the time we randomize the network, we get an initial configuration. The network, the molecular network, looks very similar to what the spectral network of the human red blood cell looks inside an atomic force microscope. We also give it the thermal agitation. So this is our initial configuration, which has the right surface area but the wrong volume. So we take this initial configuration, keep the surface area constant, deflate the volume by 40%. As we are reducing the volume, we do a free energy calculation of all the contributions to free energy that I showed you and minimize the free energy and ask the question, what is the equilibrium shape of the red blood cell? So when we do that, this is what we get. So this is free energy minimization with the right area, right volume, full network of all the molecules in the red blood cell. And we end up with a biconcave shape, and this shape will occur only when the bending modulus to shear modulus ratio is at a critical value. If you don't have that critical value, you would never get that shape. So nature made the cell a particular property with a particular mechanical signature because that not only gives the mechanical property and the deformability, it also gives the right shape and the right surface to volume ratio. So this gives us a very powerful tool to take three-dimensional computational simulation to link with pico-Newton level force measurements on the experimental side. But this is all static experiments. In, in the body, we have dynamic conditions. How do we go from static to dynamic? Optical tweezers is not a a very good simulation of how the blood flows through a blood vessel in the brain. So we decided to do in vitro measures. Right now, there is no way to visualize it in the human body. MRI just will not do it. There is no other technique. So the only techniques we have are in vitro techniques. So we decided to use microfluidic channels, PDMS polymer microfluidic devices, whose inner cross-section is exactly the same as the smallest diameter of a blood vessel in our brain. Here we take a length here, a short length, and we put in, we send the cells through this microfluidic channel. We can also put endothelial cells on the inside to simulate uh, realistic biological and biochemical conditions that exist in vivo. So this is for a healthy red blood cell, just to demonstrate how the cells go through a small uh, capillary in the body. And you can see the ability of the cell to re recover the shape. So this is the PhD thesis work of my student, Dave Quinn. So we can not only do this experiments, we can all, we've also developed a technique to do full three-dimensional computational simulations of a population of cells that go through a small blood vessel. For that, we employ a technique, a mesoscale technique, that's between molecular and continuum. In the molecular level, we have molecular dynamics-type simulations 
that are not good enough to capture a whole cell or a population of cells. On the other hand, if we use continuum techniques like Navier-Stokes equation, we don't have a lens scale that can be brought in to link to the structure of the red blood cell. So we use a technique called DPD, dissipative particle dynamics, where you take clusters of points and molecules and you assign specific molecular properties to them and interaction forces and different types of interaction uh, forces. And we can in induce momentum conserving Brownian dynamics in this. So let me demonstrate experiments and simulations. So here is an experiment of a healthy human red blood cell going through a microfluidic channel. We can quantitatively measure force and velocity. And here is a 3D computational simulation using DPD. We can link it to organ function and other types of uh, uh, bio issues. For example, we have an organ called the spleen, which is not a vital organ. And spleen plays a major role in the clearance of red blood cells with uh, uh, parasites in them. Um, the top figure is how the spleen in a mouse clears a red blood cell in a mouse. The bottom is a 3D simulation of the human spleen slit and, and our visualization in 3D of a cell, of how a red blood cell goes through it. You can see the detail to which we can capture the change of the deformability of the red blood cell here. So we are now doing in vitro, in vivo mice experiments where we are imaging how this cell is cleared in mice and calibrating our 3D models. Then we are applying to ex vivo experiments in human spleen that I'll talk about later. These are all healthy cells. So now let me go to malaria. Malaria occurs in the human body because of mosquito bites. The carrier of malaria in the human body is the human red blood cell. So when female anaphilus mosquitoes are pregnant, they need protein to nurture the eggs, so they feed on human blood. When a person being bitten has, has, exposed, has been exposed to malaria, as the gametes for malaria, the blood gets into the gut of the mosquito when the mosquito feeds again on the human skin, she injects small particles called sporocytes. The sporocytes go to the human liver. The liver takes seven to ten days to process them. And then the liver sends out one micron sized particles into the human bloodstream. That begins a 48 hour cycle called the asexual cycle of malaria in the human body. It lasts 48 hours. During 48 hours, three things happen. Two of those things are mechanical in nature, not according to engineers, but according to microbiologists who have studied this mechanical problem for 20 years. And the two mechanical effects are the following. When the parasite gets into the human red blood cell, it's protected from the immune system of the body. It transports protein to the inside of the red blood cell, to the cytosol and to the spectral network. As a result, the mechanical stiffness of the host red blood cell significantly increases. So until our work, in the community it was thought that the increase in stiffness was a factor of three to four during the course of 48 hours. Our experiments show that it's not three to four, it's more like a factor of 100. And I'll mention in a minute what the consequences are. So that's the first mechanical effect, the significant increase in stiffness. The second mechanical effect, in the later stages of the 48-hour cycle, there is a significant increase in cytoadherence or adhesion of the cell to other cells and to endothelial surface. And this causes a phenomenon called sequestration in the microvasculature. As a result, the infected, infected red blood cells get stuck. They don't circulate. As a result, they may not go to the spleen. The spleen may not be able to remove them. And this is what causes the vicious malaria cycle of um, compromised oxygen delivery. So we have cerebral malaria that causes failure, the lack of delivery of oxygen to the brain, or placental malaria in pregnant women. This is the 48-hour cycle. A malaria parasite invades a red blood cell. The zero to 24 hours is called the ring stage. 24 to 36 hours is called trophoid stage. 
36 to 48 hours is called Shaizan stage. At the end of 48 hours, the cell becomes very stiff, it becomes very sticky, and the single parasite can multiply up to 32 parasites. The cell ruptures, it spills the parasites into the bloodstream, and you will know that when somebody gets malaria, their body temperature goes up as the body tries to fight. That happens exactly when the cell ruptures. So there is a direct connection between the mechanical rupture of the cell and increase in the body temperature during malaria. And this cycle continues over and over again. So what we've been able to show in the last few years through these optical tweezers experiments is that for a healthy cell, we can precisely do these experiments at control piconewton level forces. So zero force, 68 plus or minus 10 piconewtons, 150 plus or minus 15 piconewtons, the cell stretches enormously. When there is a parasite inside the cell, because of the increase in stiffness and transfer of protein, the cell loses its ability to stretch. The inability of the cell to stretch leads to compromised delivery of oxygen to distant corners of the body. In the advanced stages of malaria, this causes fatality. You can see that even at 150 piconewtons, the cell doesn't stretch. So we've shown that there is a significant increase in stiffness up to 100 times. Why is that important? Even with, without knowing how to cure malaria. Malaria patients receive a drug to improve blood flow just like stroke patients. So there is a drug called pentaxifeline, which is given to malaria patients. And this drug is given without actually knowing um, how it affects the flow quantitatively. So what this does is that it can affect what kind of dosage you give in the drug cocktail to malaria patients can be determined by whether the st increase in stiffness is a factor of three or a factor of 100. So similarly, we are also studying quantitatively what the cytoadherence is so that we can give some guidelines for drug dosages uh, for treatments such as these. I showed you the static effect, now let me show you the dynamic effect using microfluidics. So we have a microfluidic channel whose inner diameter is only two micrometers, smaller than the smallest blood vessel in the brain. We have two red blood cells, this one and this one, that have a malaria parasite inside them, here and here. The rest are all healthy red blood cells. Because of the increase in stiffness, I would postulate that these two cells cannot move through the microfluidic channel, whereas all the other cells can move through. So let's see if that works. So you can see that these two cells, because of the increase in stiffness, cannot go through, whereas the healthy red blood cells surround them can squeeze through. But if you have many of these infected cells and increase adhesion, they will block the entrance to the, to the small blood vessel. So this is a very clear demonstration of how increased mechanical stiffness can lead to compromised blood flow and compromised delivery of oxygen. So this is demonstrated here. Now we can go one step further. Can you develop microfluidic devices that are able to diagnose from mechanical signatures in addition to other biochemical markers whether somebody has malaria? We are not there yet, but this is our dream. So I have a portable microfluidic device made using standard lithography process or microelectronics chip fabrication process. It's portable, disposable, and inexpensive. I can take it to a remote hospital in a developing country in Africa, Latin America, or Asia. I take a blood sample from a suspected malaria patient. I isolate the red blood cells. I send the cell to this microfluidic channel and ask the following questions. Does the person have malaria? Does the person have fever because of malaria? Is it plasmodium falcipara malaria or plasmodium vivax malaria? Can I find out what stage of malaria this is? Can I calculate the parasitemia, how, what fraction of the red blood cells are infected? Can I use high, high throughput cell sorting to calculate? So to do this, we have developed a technique which, for which we have a, filed a patent, and the technique is the following. Rather than having long channels, we create micro-obstacles to red blood cells. From that, we can tell if a cell is infected or uninfected, what fraction of the cells are infected. We can quantitatively measure the change in velocity. 
Plus, we can also distinguish between young red blood cells and aged red blood cells. A cell that's two days old from the bone marrow or 25 days old from the bone marrow. And because young cells, reticulocytes versus aged cells, influence different types of malaria. So here is a demonstration of our microfluidic channel. You can see how the cells navigate through. The infected cells will go through at a lower rate. The young red blood cells will go through at a lower rate. And using this, we can create a technology that's portable, disposable, and in terms of cost effectiveness, it's not there yet. But that's what we are working on. We can also create something that can detect malaria. So here is a technology that we have created in collaboration with Professor Jay Han in our electrical engineering department, where we have two depth channels. One is a shallow channel, one is a deep channel. We send red blood cells through. The healthy red blood cells can easily squeeze through the shallow channels. But the infected cells cannot squeeze through, so they need the deep channels. Intentionally, we send, send the cells not along the channel, but at an angle. As we do that, from the direction of flow, the healthy cells will flow at any angle. The infected cells can only flow along the channel. We can not only detect how many infected cells there are, we can also detect the type of malaria you have. So here is that concept is demonstrated with this device. And this is not just for malaria. You can also use it for other diseases. But I'm demonstrating it's just for red blood cells and, and malaria. You can see the healthy cells can go at an angle, but the infected cells can only go through the, the direction of the channel. So one of my collaborators, Scott Manalis, in our bioengineering department, has come up with a chip that can actually look at uh, picogram level changes in mass so you can connect it to uh, different types of disease pathogens. So Scott and I have filed a patent on how to create this and apply this for malaria detection as well as for detection for other types of human diseases. So this is something that, uh, that we've been working on for the past uh, few years. There are other types of markers you can create at the intersections of engineering, life sciences, and physics, biophysics. It's been known for quite some time, uh, for the last 100 years, that all healthy cells in the human body vibrate because they are biologically active. The amplitude of fluctuations of the membrane is of the order of nanometer. The time scale of fluctuation is of the order of millisecond. So people have been able to make point measurements at different points of the cell, but until now nobody has been able to do full field measurement of the entire cell. And because they can only make point measurements, there is a lot of controversy. There's a lot of theoretical work that has been done. The ability of the cell membrane to fluctuate is an indicator of a disease. When the fluctuation changes, we have a disease. By non-contact techniques that monitor the fluctuation, we can actually detect a disease. So last year, we published a paper in PNAS that gives us an ability to do the full field measurement with a nanometer precision, spatial precision, and a millisecond temporal precision of how cells fluctuate. Let me first demonstrate that for a healthy cell, then I'll demonstrate that for a malaria-infected cell. Before I do that, let me illustrate the principle. So this was done in collaboration with our physics department at MIT in the Harrison Spectroscopy Lab. So here is the concept. You take a cell, the cytosol of the cell has a different refractive index than the surrounding. We send a very low power laser beam through the cell. The laser beam gets di uh, diffracted. When it comes out at the other end, there is a phase shift. So we can digitally capture the phase shift. So if you know the phase shift, which is delta phi, if you know the wavelength of light, if you know the difference in refractive index, you can use the simple equation to calculate the height of the cell with a spatial resolution of a nanometer and a temporal resolution of a millisecond. So this is done in collaboration with Professor Michael Fels' group. So we have connected the experimental work with computational work and also theoretical work done in Israel in Weizmann Institute by Sam Safran and Neil Gov. And let me show you a video of our experiments. First, for a healthy human red blood cell, these are membrane fluctuations. 
at a millisecond time step and a nanometer spatial resolution. It's uniform everywhere. In the early stage of malaria parasitation, you have slightly non-uniform and reduced fluctuations. In the late stage, you have highly localized and significantly reduced fluctuations because of high stiffness, local stiffness. So you can also connect the fluctuation to stiffness maps. So next, in, in two weeks, we have a paper coming out in collaboration with the Weizmann Group, and that will specifically look at the effect of ATP. You can add ATP or deplete ATP through glucose additions, for example, and how ATP modulates membrane fluctuations and what is the spatial resolution of all of this. And I won't discuss that any further in this particular work. I want to show you one more thing. So we have had a genetics revolution in the last seven years. We know the entire human genome. The, the genome of the malaria parasite has also been decoded in the last six years. So how can we connect genetics to biochemistry and biomechanics at the cell and molecular level? So we started a collaboration with Institute Pasteur in Paris. And here is our um, work that relates to that. Institute Pasteur, as you know, has been working in infectious diseases for 150 years, and they have different field labs all over the world. Based on field work done on malaria on monkeys, they suspected that there is a particular protein called RISA protein. RISA stands for ring-infected erythrocyte surface antigen, and it was suspected that maybe RISA protein is responsible for the change in stiffness that I demonstrated. If we can figure out what protein causes a change in stiffness, we have two possibilities. We can kill the protein in the mosquito before it enters the human body, or we can kill the protein in the human body through drugs. But we need to first demonstrate if that protein plays a role in one of the pathogenic factors for malaria, which is compromised deformability. So we decided in collaboration with Pasteur the following experiment. We can take a parasite, genetically clone it, and knock out just one protein that's suspected to cause a change in deformability, in this case, the RISA protein. We can not only knock it out, we can knock it back in. That gives us a beautiful control condition. So I show you two microscope images. At the top, we have a triple immunofluorescent optical micrograph. It's color-coded three ways. So all of the red blood cells in our body have a protein called band three. Whenever there is band three protein, the cell lights up as color red in the microscope. So all the cells, healthy red blood cells, light up as color red in the microscope. The malaria parasite is color-coded blue or purple. So whenever there is a parasite here, 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 it lights up as blue. But the parasite has a RISA protein. It transports the RISA protein to the host cell. When the cell receives the RISA protein, RISA is color-coded green, so every cell that has a parasite here, this, 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 etc., changes from red to green because it has the RISA protein. Now we take the parasite, clone it, knock out the RISA protein, put it inside the red blood cell, culture it, do the same experiment here. We have band 3, so the cell turns uh, red. We have the parasite that turns purple, but there is no RISA. We knocked it out. So there is no green here. That shows that we have successfully knocked out the RISA protein. So the cloning and the knockout is done in Paris. They ship the parasites to Boston. So in my lab, we do the optical tweezers experiment. And this is what we find. This is a healthy red blood cell. This is the stiffness in the control healthy condition. Then we take the wild type parasite in the ring stage. Because of the RISA protein, the stiffness increases significantly. So this is not scatter. This is the definition of the ring stage, 24 hours. So you get a large increase in stiffness. If we take the same parasite, clone it, knock out RISA, we suppress the increase in stiffness. If we knock the RISA back in, we increase the stiffness back in the knock-in condition, which is the same as the wild type. This experiment conclusively shows that the RISA protein is responsible for an increase in stiffness in the early stage by a factor of three to four, which is almost all of the stiffness. Okay? 
Now, the biology community, microbiology community, and the parasitology community has been looking at it for 20 years. But remarkably, there's been no experiment done in the biologically relevant temperature of high fever condition. So when you do that experiment, you find the following interesting result. Here is the control condition of a healthy red blood cell. There is no temperature effect between normal body temperature and high fever condition of 41 degrees Celsius. In the wild type where you have the RISA protein, there is a strong temperature effect between 37 and 41 because the RISA protein stabilizes the molecular network. When the body tries to, our body tries to fight it by increasing the temperature of the body, RISA protein fights back. The parasite fights back. But if you eliminate RISA, that temperature dependence is killed. So now we have a path to do thera novel therapeutics by addressing this. RISA is not the only protein. We are looking at other proteins as well, but this is one of the examples. I know my time is up, but I'm going to finish with three, four slides to contrast what I showed for malaria with different types of cancer. Now, in malaria, I, I talked about the following things. When a parasite invades, it transports proteins. We can knock out those proteins. I demonstrated this with the genetic experiments. You can increase the stiffness. You can increase the cytoadherence. You have compromised blood flow, compromised deformability. So the natural question is, do we get all diseases because of compromised change in stiffness? What happens if the stiffness goes the other way? Instead of the stiffness increasing, the stiffness decreases. Can that lead to diseases? So let me give you the counter example of three different types of cancer. Pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, and blood cancer or leukemia. First, pancreatic cancer. So this work was done in collaboration with Joachim Spartz at Max Planck uh, in Stuttgart and also University of Heidelberg in Germany, and also Thomas Sufferlin, who is a clinical doctor, cancer specialist at University of Ulm in Germany. And their work showed that when people get pancreatic cancer, they also have elevated levels of a bioactive lipid in the body called SPC. It's called sphingosyl phosphorylcholine. And whenever people get this elevated level of SPC, the cancer was found clinically to spread to all parts of the body. It metastasizes. So is there a connection between SPC and mechanical deformability that leads to this metastasis of cancer? So we looked at experiments where we take a cancer cell um, and make it immunofluorescent for keratin molecules and then treat it with controlled amounts of SPC in vitro and see what happens when SPC changes the molecular network. And what you find is that when SPC affects the cancer cell and alters the keratin network, the stiffness of the cell decreases by more than a factor of three. So based on that, we hypothesize that maybe because of SPC-altered keratin modulation, the invaded cell becomes much more compliant. Because of that, it's able to more easily squeeze through size-limiting pores in the body, and maybe because of that, the cancer spreads through different parts of the body more easily and causes metastasis. This is only a speculation. When we published this work in Nature Cell Biology and also in uh, another, other journals, soon after that, a group in uh, Germany and also in Texas published a similar result for breast cancer epithelial cells. So this is deformability, uh, 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 Guck et al. work. This is a non-cancerous uh, breast epithelial cell. This is a cancerous cell, but it's not... Um, and it's non-metastatic. And then chemically, you increase the metastatic potential consistent with our results they found for the breast cancer epithelial cell. When you increase the metastatic potential, the cell becomes much more deformable. This is the second result. The third result related to the deformability pertains to leukemia. This is the work done at the UC Berkeley and University of California, San Francisco Medical School. When people get blood cancer or leukemia, they go for chemotherapy treatment. Chemotherapy, by design, not only kills cancer cells, it kills a lot of cells in the body. Even though chemotherapy regimen has improved significantly in the last 20 years, there is a negative consequence of chemotherapy called leukostasis. It's a disease because when cells die, they become very stiff. 
Leukostasis is tied to the increased stiffness of dead cells in the body as a consequence of chemotherapy. What the group in Berkeley did was the following. They took leukemia blood samples, white cell samples from the human patients, seven different types of samples, two different types of leukemia, lymphoid leukemia and myeloid leukemia. This is the work of Dan Fletcher at UC Berkeley and his collaborators. And the bay yellow colors are normal cancer cells before chemotherapy. If you do chemotherapy using one of standard chemotherapy drugs, dexamethasone or downerubicin, you find that the cells become very, very stiff in both types of cancer, blood cancer. So what they did was a controlled experiment. So once the chemotherapy drug is injected as a function of chemotherapy time, if you measure stiffness as a function of chemotherapy exposure time, you get a 30 times increase in stiffness. So what they did was they took the standard chemotherapy drug in the standard dose, added an actin polymerization inhibitor at time zero, which is the green curve, and what happens is that you supposedly get the beneficial effect of chemotherapy without the detrimental effect of increase in stiffness, which is suspected to contribute to leukostasis. If you do that even after 45 minutes, you get the blue line, you get a significant reduction in stiffness. So here there is an opportunity to influence current chemotherapy treatments for leukemia by modulating the mechanical stiffness by introducing specific actin polymerization inhibitors. This is pretty remarkable. This is only a very preliminary concept study. This is not ready for prime time, but at least it, it shows you the power of this connection. The last example was published about a year and a half ago in Nature Nanotechnology by a group in UCLA, Department of Chemistry, and UC, UCLA Medical School. They did a very clever experiment. So they took fluid samples from the lung called pleural effusions. The nice thing about their experiment is now you not only have malignant cells, you also have benign cells. So then they did atomic force microscopy studies to measure the stiffness. They did a blind test. They compared it to standard uh, cancer detection techniques, RNA-based techniques, and they correctly diagnosed who has cancer, who doesn't have cancer in 14 patient studies. This is my rendition for Nature Nanotechnology. I wrote an article that uh, was published with their paper um, of their experiment. So one of the things this points to is the possibility, and again, this very preliminary work, possibility that we can take all the existing cancer detection tools, some of which have an effic efficacy of only 60 to 70 percent. Now we can add to that an additional tool that adds a mechanical signature. And uh, this points to novel aspects of what we can possibly do in the future. So with this, I would like to conclude. I've demonstrated at the single cell and molecule level through experiments and computations, possible connections between systematic progression of disease state and mechanical signature that's precipitated by biochemistry. I've shown how you can connect genetic manipulation and single cell assays to link the two to possible diagnostics, therapeutics, or drug efficacy assays. I demonstrated possible portable devices using microfluidics, and also a possible gene knockout techniques in the case of malaria for uh, potential uh, therapeutic treatments. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Suresh, for your fascinating lecture. As we, have, we are off schedule, and although I guess there are many uh, potential questions, I suggest that uh, maybe you take advantage of the lunch break and uh, uh, contact uh, Professor Suresh directly with questions. Just a, a note, we are now leaving for uh, the exhibition here outside and lunch. In the two tents, I suggest that first don't go only to the closer tent, but also to the next one. And if you see that it's too busy, don't worry. Go to the exhibition first and then go for lunch. You will have no, no lack of food, I promise you. So enjoy it. And we are back after we return from lunch. There is one parallel session here on nanomaterials. All other parallel sessions will be held at the uh, engineering class building. <laughs>